specifically to what China did today. Why is China so threatened by trading in cryptocurrencies? I think what China really wants to do, like many other governments, is to maintain control of the digital payments within the country, but more importantly, also to make sure that cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are not used as conduits to take money in and out of the country through unofficial channels. Now, China has already been trying to cut down its tech giants, including Ant Financial to size. Alipay and WeChat Pay dominate the digital payment space in China, um, and China wants to make sure that its fiat currency, the yuan, issued by the central bank, still has a role to play, which is why they're thinking of issuing a digital yuan. But I think cryptocurrencies are, of course, much harder to regulate. So China had already banned initial coin offerings, which is sort of like the IPOs of the cryptocurrency world. It had banned its financial institutions from undertaking any sort of trading in cryptocurrencies. But now it's directly prohibiting its citizens, which is certainly going to have a dampening effect on their ability to use cryptocurrencies uh, for any sort of transactions. Uh, so, Professor, um, I understand that governments like to regulate things, particularly if they're powerful, such as currencies. That makes sense. But we also have some skepticism, not just from China, but we have Madame Lagarde, president of the ECB. We have Jay Powell, chair of the Fed, expressing real doubts about what these things are. I mean, I guess they were created as a means of exchange, according to you in your book, and then they became methods of val uh, restoring value. But in fact, do they do either of those things? So as a medium of exchange, uh, Bitcoin and many other cryptocurrencies of its kind have certainly not worked very well. They have very unstable value. They are not easy to use. They take time uh, for uh, transactions to be processed. They cannot handle large volumes of transactions. But they seem to have become speculative asset undergirded by just one principle, which is that of scarcity. And of course, the technological razzle-dazzle underlying them. Bitcoin, for instance, um, has a hard cap on its algorithm. There are only 21 million Bitcoins can ever be minted. About 18 and a half million have been minted so far. It's hard to imagine that scarcity by itself, David, can be a durable source of value. So a new breed of cryptocurrency, stable coins, now tries to deal with that problem by essentially creating a backing through fiat currencies. Facebook plans to issue its own cryptocurrency called DM, which will be backed up by reserves of uh, dollars and dollar-related securities. But that creates another set of risks. Now, who knows what sort of people are going to be transacting using Facebook's currency? Who will be using the, that currency to trade across borders? And the other problem is we don't really know what Facebook will ultimately end up holding as reserves. So you could end up just like we did with the global financial crisis, where money market mutual funds, which were seen as very safe investments, turned out not to be that safe. So there are financial risks as well as risks about what sort of illicit activities and other types of unregulated activities could go through the payment system if it is decentralized in this form. Well, and Chair Gensler, as I understand, is addressing in part that very issue about stable coins. You can say that they're backed up by reserves, but how do you know that they really are? There have been some instances where it appears it wasn't really cash on hand. It's backed up by. But but as you describe this, if it's not an ex effective medium of exchange, I guess in part because it varies so much, it fluctuates so much, how can you set a price in it? If it may, more is a matter of speculation, what's its function? How, how does it make the world a better place? Or is it mainly for almost entertainment and speculation the way if we go to Atlantic City, we can gamble? So if you think about Bitcoin and then some of the newer meme coins that have emerged, which don't even pretend to have any underlying functions, it's clear that people seem to be relying on the greater fool theory that if you buy this asset, um, you just need to find somebody who's willing to take it on at a somewhat higher price. But you know, David, the underlying technology of Bitcoin, I think, is what is really going to be transformative. And I think it's that technology that people are to some extent betting on. Because, you know, there are many frictions in international uh, finance and domestic finance. Many people don't have easy access to digital payments. You know, in the U.S., you need a debit or credit card or a bank account to have access to digital payments. International payments are still beset by lots of impediments. They are expensive. They are uh, very time-consuming. It's very difficult to track payments. So there is a real need for better digital payments that people have access to without uh, necessarily being well off. Uh, you need better international payments. So I think this technology is what might lead us to a world where, in fact, you can have payments being much easier, much more efficient, where um, everybody has access to them. 
And in addition, you might have better financial products and services, which really need to the democratization of finance. But that is a promise for the future. It's not quite there yet. Right now, we have a lot more of the speculative risks rather than the benefits being apparent.